In this video, we're going to take a look at verbs. And for our definition of verbs, we're going to say that verbs express an action, event, process, or state. Uh, some people don't like this definition of verbs, but I think it'll do good enough to get us through this course. And over time, you'll encounter more definitions of verbs that are much more in depth. Uh, but for now, this should be good. Okay, there's three subclasses of verbs that we need to talk about right off the bat, just to get some basic understanding of how verbs work and how they're different. Okay, there are intransitive verbs, transitive verbs, and ditransitive verbs. So intransitive verbs take one argument. Now, what do I mean by one argument? Well, typically I mean one noun phrase as an argument. Uh, some verbs take prepositional phrases, as complement phrases as arguments as well. Uh, we'll touch on those when we get to them. But I'll give you two examples here. The first example is the door opened. Okay, so our verb is opened. And there is one thing that is opening. And that one thing is the noun phrase, the door. The door is open. So the door is our argument here. And one way we can represent this logically is to say something like the verb is opened X which means there's some variable that is opened. So in this case, we could replace X with the door. So this would be the door opened. Um, here's another example in Irish for yelled he, as we can see here in this language Irish, the verb occurs first, and then the argument, which is he, occurs afterwards. So this sentence, he yelled, yelled only takes one argument, and that argument of yelled is he. So instead of saying yelled x for logically, uh, we could say yelled he for he yelled. Okay, so these intransitive verbs just take one argument. Uh, what are some other words like he ran, or he jumped, or um, he sang. So in these sentences, all of these verbs are intransitive. Now you might say, wait, what if we say he sang a song? Well, in that case, then we'd be considering he sang a song. That saying would be transitive. And transitive verbs take two arguments. So it's important right away to note that some verbs can be transitive and intransitive. It just depends on the context they're being used. So example three, James ate popcorn. So ate is our verb. Now we can see there's two arguments. The first argument is James, which is the eater. And popcorn is the second argument, which is the thing that is being eaten. Okay, so James ate popcorn. So we can write this logically as something like 8xy, and this would be something like x8y, okay? Or more specifically, someone ate something. We can think about it like that too. So this takes two arguments, so someone ate something, okay? Let's take another look at another Irish example. So break past, okay, so this is the past tense of break, and then we also have another two noun phrases as arguments. The first one is she, and the second one is the chair. So note again that in Irish, we have the verb coming first, and then we have the subject, and then we have the object. So this is a VSO language. Okay, so it might seem a little bit difficult to figure out, well, where's the boundary point between the two arguments? So in this case, you know, looking at the gloss helps. So she broke the chair. Again, just like the English example, broke would be a transitive verb that takes two arguments. It takes someone to do the breaking and something to be broken. Okay, so the question is, just like with the intransitive saying, well, we have James ate popcorn, but what if we just had the sentence James ate? Okay, so the question is, well, what is this verb? Well, in this case, this is an intransitive ate. So this eight is intransitive because it only takes James as an argument. It doesn't have any other arguments. So these are one of those verbs that can be either intransitive or transitive depending on the context. 
So a lot of the time, the question is, does the verb take a subject? Does the verb take an object? If it takes one of those, then it is an intransitive verb. If it takes both, it's transitive. Okay, so we have to look at verbs in context to determine whether they're intransitive or transitive. Now, there's a third class of verbs. Those are ditransitive verbs, and these have three arguments. So here's a good example. In number five, Trevor sent the students the exam. So sent takes three arguments. The first argument is Trevor, so it is someone doing the sending. The second argument is sent the students. Uh, so the students is an argument and the exam is another argument. So when you send something, someone sends something to someone. So Trevor is sending the exam to the students. Uh, the word order here is a little bit off, uh, but you can still see there's three separate noun phrases that sent takes. Uh, in fact, 7a and 7b kind of show this difference. So John gave Kim a scooter. So John, Kim, and a scooter are all arguments. And in 7b, John gave a scooter to Kim. In this case, this to Kim isn't a noun phrase argument. It is a prepositional phrase argument. But they are still three different arguments there. So someone gave something to someone. Those are three arguments. Uh, let's take a look at this Chadian Arabic. So they send past third plural letter to father there. Okay, so same pattern here. We have sent and for the arguments, they is the one doing the sending. Letter is the thing being sent and to their father is where the thing is being sent. So once again, three arguments. Okay. So hopefully we can di distinguish between three different types of verbs. Uh, again, their logical representation here. You don't have to know this too much, but if you do look at my mathematical linguistics course, um, you'll see these representations all the time in semantics. So just to kind of expose you to, to them now, um, I think is beneficial. If you don't understand them quite yet, you're not really familiar with math, don't worry about it for this course. Uh, but if you go into semantics later, you'll see these representations. Okay, so here's some exercises. Let's classify the verbs in these sentences. Um, so one, I'm, I'm kind of tricking you a bit. So James cried all night. So cried. How many arguments is cried taking in this sentence? Well, it's taking one. It's taking James. So who's doing the crying? James is doing the crying. So here's the question. So, so this is intransitive. But what about all night? Well, all night isn't an argument. So something isn't crying um, at all night or isn't crying in all night. All night is modifying how James cried or when James cried or how long James cried. So this is a modifier or also known later as an adjunct. So this isn't a direct argument of the verb. This is like an optional argument. Okay, so this only modifies how the crying was taking place. It doesn't modify what was being cried or what at the crying was occurring, if that makes any sense. Uh, we'll see more of these later, but again, just exposure. Just because there are words that come after it doesn't mean it's the object of the sentence. This is just a modifier of cry. Okay, what about Emma murdered the shopkeep shopkeeper? Well, murdered is our verb. Um, there is someone doing the murdering, which is Emma. And then there is something being murdered, which is the shopkeeper. So someone is murdering someone, which means there are two arguments here. So this is transitive. Okay. And I'll write the first one as intransitive, just to make it very clear for those who did not listen and just skipped along. Okay. What about Louise sent the bomb? Okay, so in the previous slide, we saw sent as a ditransitive verb, for Trevor sent the students the exam. But in this case, sent well there is a sender which is louise and there's something being sent which is the bomb but there's no third argument that says to who so in this case sent is transitive and the question is can all ditransitive verbs be transitive 
Well, no. In fact, you can't say something like, Louise gave the bomb. You have to say, Louise gave the bomb to someone. So in this case, we cannot have gave being transitive, but we can have sent being transitive. So these are the differences between different verbs. We have to take a look at the context and is it okay? So if I gave you a sentence, Louise gave the bomb, uh, it's not grammatical. And it's not grammatical because it's missing that third argument, because it has to be ditransitive. Okay, hopefully you're there and you kind of grasp this. As always, you can, you know, post verbs and sentences in the comments and you can ask and I can help you out with that. Uh, but let's let's move on to some properties of verbs. Okay, so verbs carry tense. And this is something really obvious. <laughs> I, I think it's obvious for any speaker of any language. Of course, you know, some verbs will carry tense. For instance, Kate eats candy versus Kate ate candy versus Kate will eat candy. So eats is a present tense. So it says, yeah, she is, well, not currently eating, but she does eat candy. Uh, Kate ate candy, of course, this is past tense. And in English, we don't have future tense on verbs. Instead, we introduce this auxiliary verb, will, to mean the future. So Kate will eat candy. Okay, so in this sense, English doesn't have future tense on verbs. Instead, we introduce an auxiliary verb to, to show future tense. And this kind of pattern is common across languages. So most languages distinguish between past and non-past on verbs. So we're one of those people, or we're one of those languages. So we either have past or present, okay? Um, in fact, the future also takes the same form as the present generally, just minus the inflectional S morphology. Uh, but some languages just do between future and non-future. So in this case, they would have a word for present, a word for future, and then they'd have some auxiliary verb or something else to express past. Okay, so there's these kinds of uh, dichotomies, I guess, where, you know, English is past, non-past, some languages are future, non-future. Okay, so one thing verbs can tell us are the tense, when in time something occurs. Another thing they can tell us is aspect. So whether an event is completed, whether it's repeated, whether it's ongoing, uh, the state of an event. So English, if we take a look at 11 first, has progressive and perfect. Okay, so progressive means something Kate was eating. And usually we do the progressive with this ing ending as well as this auxiliary was, or progressive was, we can say. Okay, we also have the perfect, eat in. So this is with the en ending on our verbs, and it's always accompanied by some form of have, whether it's past, present, or future. Okay, uh, but there are other languages that have more than this. So for instance, uh, in Shibamba, they are working, so they have the progressive as well, but they also have this other type of aspect called habitual aspect. So instead of bale bomba, they would say bala bomba, for they repeatedly work. So this is a habitual thing. So they have this marker that says habitual. In English, we just have this word repeatedly. But in the morphology of verbs, or the syntax of verbs in Chibemba, they have an infix that is the habitual marker. So that's something that we don't have in English. And that's really cool to look at other languages that do. Um, in fact, there is a dialect of English that has habitual markers, and that is African-American vernacular English has habitual markers for they be working, which is different than they are working. Okay, we might see that in the future, um, but that's just an interesting thing to point out, that even some dialects of English have habitual markings on verbs. Okay, so that's aspect. Another thing is mood, which uh, we, we have in English, but we're not usually too aware of it. Uh, so, for instance, Jake leaves for Chicago tomorrow. So these are hypothetical and real events. So indicative. Indicative, it's it's happening tomorrow. So Jake leaves for Chicago tomorrow. That is absolutely going to happen. Uh, but in this 13, Jake would leave for tomorrow if he were lucky enough. So this is the subjunctive. This is the hypothetical. Like, oh, hypothetically, if Jake were lucky enough, 
he would leave for Chicago tomorrow. That's kind of what this subjunctive tells us. And we've had this in English, but we don't usually use this. Uh, the other thing I want to point out in this sentence is that we have this modal would. Now, modals aren't really part of the mood in English, um, but we do see other modals that are just, they, they act very similarly. So would, um, should, must, may, could, uh, I'm sure there's more, can, uh, but these are just some of the modals you should look out for because I will talk about modals quite frequently as we go forward. Okay, so we have tense, we have aspect, we have mood. So the final thing is agreement, and we do have this in English. And what I mean by agreement is that our verb endings have to match the subject, at least in English. So I walk, well, when we have I, we can just take the verb as is. But if we have a third person singular, such as he, we need this third person singular morphology in our verb. So we have to say he walks. We can't say he walk. So this is agreement, where we have to have the morphology agreeing with our subject. Okay, um, something you'll see as in French, for example, on nouns is gender agreement. So you'll have, let's say, I think window is feminine. So you need a feminine article to introduce it as well. And that's agreement on nouns. Okay, let's take a look at Canberra. So Canberra has agreement on verbs for the subject and the object. So here we have she and we have the sarong. Okay, so these are third singular. So on the verb for she weaves the sarong, we have a third singular subject marker that agrees with the subject on the verb. And then we have a third singular object marker on the verb that agrees with the object. Okay, so if we had the word I as the subject, then we would need a different marker on the verb as a subject in order to get a correct and grammatical sentence. Okay, so these are all the different things that verbs can do in languages. Uh, of course, there's a couple of minor things I haven't talked about that are very rare to come across in the languages you do in these courses. Um, but really, the, these are the core basics that you should know when looking at different languages and analyzing data sets. So if you have any questions about these, please leave them in the comments below and I'll answer them as quick as I can. Uh, the next video is going to be nouns, and nouns have quite a few more properties than verbs, so stay tuned for that.